Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All Things Podcast, Episode 85, Coronavirus, COVID-19, and Working from home and your host matt lawrence and i'm joined again by my co-host mike Coran. if you've been enjoying the podcast so far and you want to support us there's a couple of ways you could do that you can review us on apple Podcasts or on the podcast platform that you're listening to this on you can also check us out on patreon we have a couple of tiers right now but the three dollar tier will give you a shout out in the podcast and we will share a link to your website in our show notes and the most important one is just to tell your friends or anyone else you know that we are here and ready to be listened to and if you or your friends are ready to go a step further you can come check out our discord server with well over 400 members, we're all chatting away about different programming things from UIs to PHP to whatever else you could think of, including movies, TV, and other off-topic elements. But, as I'm sure everyone's weekly pain points are going to be, Mike, take it away with the weekly yeah, pain points. Yeah, I was going to say, like, everyone's weekly pain point for the first time in probably the history, I was going to say of the show, but, like, that seems, the history of everything. Yeah, oh yeah. Is the same thing. Well, I have, is... no, I, I have a, d- a slightly different one. Come on okay. now. All right. Well, no, go ahead. No, no, no you okay, can go yeah, ahead yeah. first. No, no. It's... Okay, okay. So, <laughs> this isolation due to the coronavirus uh, is definitely my weekly pain point because it's weird. I don't know. Like, it hasn't been terrible for me because I work from home. I think, I think, to be perfectly honest, I'm probably in one of the best situations over everyone else because not much has changed in my day to day. Other than the fact that I can't, like, I don't go out to restaurants, I avoid, you know, public spaces too much, and, like, we don't have any plans to go out anymore. Everything else has remained the same, other than also the, you know, the constant news and, you know, doom and gloom of everything, because it's everything so weird. The news is the news new. is damn horrible. It's yeah, the horrible. news is, yeah, I, I read, I read, I was in bed, like, two nights ago, and I, like, went on the news, and I'm like, this is a terrible idea. People immediately overreact about everything i'm not saying that this is an overreaction but like people go like 10 steps over every time oh yeah in all the comments never read the comments that 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 was my mistake it's like i read an article and it was like you know something something was happening and it seemed pretty mundane and then i read the comments and people were like oh this means that like you know everything's even 10 times worse than people are saying etc etc and i'm like jesus that's the comments are like the especially facebook comments are fucking scary they're yeah. scary on, on these COVID yeah. articles. Don't like it. Don't like the comments. Read the articles. Make your own assumptions. Read more than one article from more than one source. That's that's my suggestion. Well, my weekly pain point is that, <laughs> and I wrote this down. <laughs> <clears throat> the democratic hoax that is coronavirus or COVID-19. Like how we have the the whole episode is on coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a joke, everybody. I mean, that is a joke. Everyone calm down. I'm intentionally doing a joke. Just... I mean, to be fair, the 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 space in between you saying it and us be, treating it seriously is about, about the same space that like it was said in, in media and people started treating it seriously. It's like, oh, it's a democratic hoax. And then all of a sudden. It's like, wait a second. Someone's dead over there. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shut it down. Like, like, shut everything I, down. It's like on the news as soon as they were saying it, someone in the background just, hmm. Like, oh, I don't <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, I think the scariest part, actually, here's, here, here's my, here's my actual weekly pain point. Okay. Well, to clarify, I think COVID is real. So let's all calm down. COVID-19 is real. And the thing I'm scared the most about it is I don't know how scared to be. Like I went to the store the other day because toilet paper is in short supply. We couldn't buy any. So I went to the store and bought a bunch of toilet paper and I bought some 99 cent hand sanitizer for 12.99. So that was some good gouging. But then I went down the road and bought $40 of gas for 20 bucks. So I'm up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> being gouged in one way and then saving money in the other. I mean, that's fine, I guess. But, one of the scariest things, like hands down, hands down, is I don't know how scared to be. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, yeah. I'm supposed to get, like, my car oiled, just for an example. Just a real, this is a mundane, this is a mundane thing. I get my car oiled in the last two weeks of, of March every time. Now, do I do that? Or do I not do that? But then if I don't do that, <laughs> like, it needs to happen. Like, it's supposed to happen every year. To treat the vehicle. So, like, I understand people will be like, well, it's an old car and stuff. I get that. But what I mean is, is, like, I would never have ever thought in my life that this would be the consideration. Been like, 
do I go and get my cars like regular maintenance? Like, what do yeah. I do? I mean, like, like seriously though, like I'm, I'm it's a serious question. Like, do I do that? I don't know. I. This is a really, it's a really weird situation because getting your car oiled is is not an, an essential thing. It's in not my essential. Eyes. Well, it's essential in due to the car's age, I'd say. But it's, I, I still would not say it's essential because it's not. It's but not even gonna... if if my car broke, do I get that fixed? Like I I I, I, I am I am personally at a point. If your car where broke, I am, where I am unable, yes. I am unable to decide what to do. Like I don't know where the line is. I think okay. So the essential thing is if you're in need of a car and you rely on a car, in in your like in in in, ca- in your case, yes, because you need a car to be able to go get groceries because you don't live near any grocery grocery stores. I mean, they're not super far, but. It would be a real big pain to walk there and walk. You can back. you can absolutely walk it, but it uh, you'll probably be actually exposed to more people. Yeah. So, but the other case is that you have a car at home. So, is it essential or not? I don't know. Like I, I would probably like if if my car broke down, I'd probably wait till all this blew over. If that's if- see that that that's the thing is like is like and I think this might be what the panic is is how much so we're talking about. You know, sub a thousand people in Ontario, which is where we live, which is the most populated province of Canada, and we have sub a thousand people that have this thing. So, realistically speaking, how spread is this? Like, this is where I struggle with this because I don't know, I don't know how much to freak out. Like, should we just be going to grocery stores and just be washing our hands extra? And just be following those instructions or should, and like obviously social distancing, like don't be going to big groups and stuff like that. Or should we be like actually shutting it down and being like, that's it. Like I'm not literally leaving this home and I'm going to start rationing food. And like, obviously I can still go and get food, but should I be rationing? Like, should I be limiting the amount of times I leave? And so the answer to all those questions statistically, I would imagine, and I am not a medical professional. I'm going to preface this whole episode right now by saying Mike and I are not medical professionals. Please consult your local health authority and or doctor for advice and actual real information because I don't know. I'm speaking from a – this is like an editorial. This is my opinion. But like from what I'm seeing, it's like statistically it's more unsafe to leave. But people are still going to work. People are still – I don't know anyone that isn't working. So – like, is that it? Like, I don't know what to say. Like, it, it, should we still be going and doing, like, should we still be going and doing some things without a care? Like, should I go, should I make the appointment today and go get my car done? It's, it's a like, really tough, it's a really tough thing because but isn't it neither of us tough? have the answer. It's fucked yeah, that, that it's tough. Like, it's yeah. really weird. Yeah. And neither of us have the answer that we can really confidently say with the thing. In your case, sure, like, you should, like, do it. Because you're no, you don't even live in in a larger city. You live in a in a pretty small city, and the place where you get your oiling done is even like more north or whatever. More uh, it's more rural. it's more rural, yeah. Yeah, so it's on, literally on a mo- dirt road. And there's no need for you to be, you know, anywhere like a meter, a meter like closer to the person. Like you don't need to be right up to him. You don't need to shake his hand when you're doing your car oiling. So in that case, I could say like there is an argument for you to just do it just to kind of live your normal life in that case. Maybe that'll make you feel better because, you know, any sort of normality in this kind of situation is probably a good thing. On the other hand, is it worth it to like... To do the risk? Like that's to, the question. Like the risk is very, very minimal in, in your in your specific scenario. I'm not saying for everyone else. In your specific scenario, from what I can see, it's very, very minimal. But is it worth it? Like what... Like, what am I getting out of this? Currently, my car is in limbo. Do I get a new one this year or do I not? So that means the oiling might be, like, useless. I think the only thing you get out of this is mental, is a mental break. Like, it's... it's Yes, yes. Yeah, because it's weighing on you, obviously, if you're thinking about it. And doing it will make you feel... Again, like I said, it'll bring some normality back to your routine and it might make you feel better. But, again, you have to weigh weigh for yourself if it's worth it, even with that tiny little bit of risk... It's really tough. I, I, it, it, all these situations, and, and again, your other question, like going out to get groceries, 
if you have the groceries at home already to be able to eat normally and get all your vitamins and all that throughout the day, is it worth it to go and get something that you really, really like that you don't have at home? Like maybe you're missing the, your favorite chips. Okay. You have all the food you have, your, you know, you have all your food at home. You, you have, have everything, but you that, forgot the chips. But you forgot the chips, right? In what situation is it okay for you to go and grab those chips? Like, is, is it worth risking yourself, risking other people exposing? Like we're, we're, we both haven't traveled in the last 14 days. So we're not, we're probably not sick with it. Right. Like if we were in self-isolation, I would say there's no at, at no point is there any way for you to actually go out. So like if you were just came back from somewhere. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not doing and that. You were, I'm not and going to the Yeah, and then you're not going out. But in, in our case, we're not in that situation. Like we're we both technically are healthy and can go out and like we probably haven't been exposed. Again, that asterisk on the probably. Um so yeah. I, I don't have an answer for you, but I think this is all, all these questions are what people are asking and thinking to themselves with, and they all have, like, everyone will have their own limitation. Like some people can't live without the chips and they will go and grab the chips. Otherwise they'll go insane or something. I don't know. Yeah. Like my, my girlfriend went out yesterday and bought a TV. Like, and she has two TVs, but she bought a retro TV because she wanted to play Genesis while this was, this was like happening. Okay. So like immediately broke self isolation to go to like a thrift mm. store to buy like yeah. an old like tube TV. Yeah. So not non essential like stuff like and that's what super I mean. like, non essential. I, I I see that and this is turning into more of like a, just a talking. I guess it will be just a talking episode throughout the whole thing anyway. So that's fine. But I see that all the time. Like my parents are gun ho about going to the to the store. They went to Costco like twice last or three times last week. And then they're already mentioning again that they want to go to Costco and they bought everything they need. But there's like a few small, tiny little things that are on their mind. They're like, well, what if we don't have enough? Uh, I don't even know what it was. It's like ground beef or something like we need more ground beef. But we have everything else and we have more than enough of it. But they need that one thing. And it just like cycles in their mind that they can't go out and they're just constantly thinking about going out and getting it. It's really really panic inducing. It might be literally worse than the actual pandemic in some regards. Because if you're in an area that is not ever like there's going to be some towns that I would estimate anyway that aren't going to be affected. But like you're going to be under the same stress when you technically didn't need to be but also should be also should be and possibly the social distancing and the anxiety and the not going out may have actually been the reason why you your town wasn't exposed yeah like Ah. i think i think personally if it was up to me i just wouldn't risk anything like i would just bunker down and eat like plain white rice and canned chicken until this all blows over if i had that opportunity well we bought we bought a whole bunch of chicken like a whole bunch like a like 18 pounds of chicken yeah, like frozen chicken, like you yeah, froze it all? Yeah, intentionally because we were like, we want something that, so basically we had already had food, and apparently we're doing weekly grocery shopping still, like normal, so that's interesting. But um, we are, basically we we said we're going to get all this food that's non-perishable, so we got this, uh, we got this chicken, and then later that week I went and I went and got a bunch of frozen dinners, and my thought process is, and granola bars, and my thought process was, we want something that is frozen so it doesn't go bad. So we're not going to actually eat that. We're going to eat the regular weekly groceries. And then when the it when or if the time comes where shit's actually like really on lockdown and we can't get food, then we have these non-perishables. Also, I wanted uh, also I wanted it to be uh, mobile. So the the frozen stuff isn't mobile, but the granola bars are. And I wanted like some food and such to be something where I could take it with me. Like I don't think there's going to be an evacuation or anything like that. But it might be something like we need to all go to a separate isolation area. And so you could easily just grab like over 100 granola bars from what I bought and just like leave. So that's sort of my mentality on that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so- I mean, like it, exactly is because because I we, we went out and bought like rice, like a big bag of rice from Costco just in case because that you can make a lot of meals with that. Uh, we brought we bought buckwheat. That's that's a good like nutritious meal stuff like that like just in case maybe there is a situation where you might have to be locked in, like you said weekly grocery shopping is probably going to still happen. 
Right. Like, mo- like most likely you will at least once a week go out and get your needed supplies and stuff that you want because we're not in a situation yet where it's super prohibitive. Like it's still a risk, but it's not like 100% you're going to get it because we're not in a hot zone. But if I had the choice myself, I might just like bunker down and just wait this out because what I don't know. It's a weird situation. I feel like overreacting is a decent alter like a, a decent alternative to it being wor- it getting worse. Like I'd rather overreact and get this solved than underreact and have it go out of control. Even though there's in both cases there's, you know, chances of it not happening to the extent that we're thinking it will. Do you know what I think the the biggest panic point is, or at least for me is is that the numbers of infected people in Canada are very low in comparison to our population and very low in comparison to other countries. But the panic, whenever it goes up by like 10 or 20, is what I think I'm worried about. Because I'm the, what I, I'm extrapolating that and saying, okay, well, if we're panicking at sub 1,000, what happens if it goes to 2,000? Like, are we going to be like shooting each other in the streets? <laughs> like, like, well... Like, there's only so far you can go. Like, what are we going to be doing? Yeah. There's only so much toilet paper you can buy. Although that's dumb. I'd never... I, when everyone was buying toilet paper, we're like, I'm going to buy this food first, I think. Yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't understand. Like, you know, it, it makes sense to go out and get, like, one, you know, big thing of toilet paper. One. Because that'll last you a couple of weeks, maybe a month or two. Why are people going out and loading their entire cart up with, like, ten packages of toilet paper? Like, what was the, what was the logic there? That... Unless you're trying to resell it, which is a really big dick move, but like That's unless bad, you're trying, yeah. to, unless, which a lot of people try, like did and got called out on and stuff. But a lot of people are just like literally hoarding it because they're afraid that I guess if this goes for years, they'll run out of toilet paper. Like I don't, how much toilet paper are you using? It's That'd weird, be interesting it, to see if it, if this actually. I don't think it's going to go for years because China's already coming no. back. Like I would say, but. Another question is, is like, if we, if this does go for years, is it just like a, is it just like another thing you can get? Like, like mosquitoes kill people every day. Like, literally every day, mosquitoes, things that you don't even think about. So every time you, so technically speaking, by going outside during a season in which mosquitoes are present in your area, because like it's seasonal here in Canada, it is technically, uh, you are putting yourself at a higher risk than you would if you stayed home. Yeah, I think I think maybe that's actually another big point is the fact that we're not sure how much more of a risk we're talking here. This is a new risk that's introduced itself, but it's like how much of a risk like this is all. Speculation. I don't I don't know whether anyone can answer this, and this is probably why it hasn't been answered. I I also don't like doctors saying the window is closing to 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 contain it. Oh, oh, okay, Jesus. All right. You know, what do we do? Uh, I have no ideas at this time. Oh, uh, all right. Then why did you just say that? Now, I, I read that on Twitter. God knows if that's real. But, like, if you don't have any ideas, why? The window's closing. Everyone help. Okay, Jesus, what do you need? I don't know. Um, all right. So, that's it, I guess? <laughs> it's a weird, it's a weird situation. Like, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why the self-isolation is needed, right? Like, I can I can name a few that I know for sure are the reasons. Uh, to give you at least some facts in this episode is hospitals can't handle the amount of complication, complicated cases Great. that will arise if the entire population gets infected or like a big portion of the population gets infected. Our hospital system, especially in Canada, is not designed to handle this kind of thing at all. Oh, like, yeah. We're not even, you we're go not to the emergency close. room, you, wait, you can wait like six to 24 yeah. hours. Yeah. Now, one thing that and I and I already told you this, Matt. But like the 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 big takeaway from this, in my opinion, for the entire world, is the the strategies, the implementations. Like what we've been doing is now going to be placed into systems to take care of this kind of thing in the future. Because this has never happened before to this extent. No, it's never happened before. But the chances of it happening in the future are pretty high i would say like something like this could happen again and another portion of that is that something like this could happen more again at a serious level on a more intense level like at a you know something that's worse than this disease than this virus so i think the systems and stuff that we're doing now all these 
practices that we're implementing, the shutting down, the quarantining, the people getting used to it, will help us in the future. Because if we're prepared in the future for more, like, you know, maybe hospitals will have maybe not necessarily like just more hospitals, but maybe they'll have a way to create quick temporary hospitals for these kinds of situations. Like maybe they'll invest in quick, you know, like what China was doing. Or like a military maybe, sort of yeah. like situation where they can, because they have military, more mobile, mobile hospitals, obviously. Exactly. Like maybe that will become more, more readily available so that that can be like quickly set up so that it can happen. Now getting more doctors is a big other thing, but maybe we can, you know, extend on that in the future like maybe we can get more doctors going in in canada and stuff like that maybe we can reduce those wait times to prepare for something like this um economically obviously this is a whole other issue and i don't want to really get into it because we don't know what's going to happen but i think there is something to be said about implementing these systems and going full bore to make sure that in the future we're also prepared for it because yes right now it's not the worst thing that could happen in the world. Like it's not the worst thing. It's bad. It's really, really bad. But it could be a lot worse. Like what? It, like if, if it spread as quick, if it spread as easily as COVID nineteen, but was as deadly as SARS. Yeah, or Ebola or something like that. If it was in that category, then we would be in a lot more trouble. And if we didn't go through this, maybe we would be in way more trouble. So anyway, I think. We got to find the positives in in this somehow, and that's one thing that I've been kind of clinging on to. Well, I did hear that. Um, I did hear that SARS changed our hospitals forever, and so this is why our hospitals are kind of dealing with this in a relatively, you know, not panicked way, from what I can tell. Although I've never been, I haven't been to a hospital, but I we've also been told not to go to the hospital for needless reasons. So I'm not going to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's just, just that easy. Um, but yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you want to dive into the segments here. I don't know how many people have already tuned out or how many people are like, this is a programming podcast. Yeah, well, the world's affected by this or we're part of the world. So get your pitchfork and put it down. Anyway, uh, so we were, well, our first segment here, I guess, was social distancing, uh, which is keeping away from people and especially groups of people. Um, and then also one of the big things that Mike and I are having trouble with, as we've already touched on, is convincing family members to do the same. Like, I have a pretty frail uncle, and he's just going to he's just gonna go out, and he doesn't care. Like, it's just like, no, like, we're doing this until I get sick, and then I'll isolate. But you're already sick. So, like, you're, you're sick in general, like not with coronavirus. He's sick in general. So he's immunocompromised. So you he I even told him, I was like, do not go out and do anything. And like, I will bring you food and stuff like just give me a shopping list and I'll go do it kind of thing and I was like even if you need gas like God knows where you're going but if you're coming here let's say to to this house coming to going to a family member's house which is fine if you're going to a family member's house and you need gas tell me and I will go and touch the gas pump because I'm kind of like the sacrificial lamb I'm younger so just statistically if I get sick I'm gonna be okay statistically so like that's just it but it, I don't know people just they don't take it seriously. I don't know. I don't know. Like, you, you you offer the services. It's not like I'm being a dick and being like, well, don't go out, but I'm not going to help you. Like, I'm literally saying, hey, don't do this. I'll do this for you. Just stay home. No. Okay. I find <sighs> everything changes as soon as one case gets announced that people know. Like, people take it. They don't take it seriously until something happens, which is unfortunate. But that's how we are as a society. Um, for the most part, the way that like the way that people counteract it is like, oh, it's not, it's just the flu, which it isn't in my opinion. Like, yes, it has flu like symptoms and all that. Um, but it's, there's much higher chance of developing, uh, respiratory complications, which is a big problem, uh, for asthmatics and stuff like that. And people that already have respiratory problems, it's a huge issue. So it's not just like the flu. That's the one thing that I want to that I always have to fight. Like people just keep saying that over and over again. It's, I, oh, I yeah, think it's because has... of the symptoms, though. It's like people just think like, oh, shit, I have the flu. But it's like, fuck, do you? Yeah. Exactly. So, but a lot and a lot of people will experience very mild. Like, because the other thing is that the flu sometimes lasts a week or so, right? Like a bad fever and stuff like that. Like a bad flu case. I've had it a couple times where I've been sick for like a week. Whereas this has for the most part, even milder symptoms for people that don't experience it on a severe level. 
Like apparently it's like a two day fever and then you're kind of good. Oh, so it's wow. like a mild flu. So for people that don't experience it, and that's why I think a lot of people are associating it with like the flu and a mild flu and it's, it's this is a joke or whatever. But it's not because of a how easy it is to pass, like how easy it is to contract. Um, it sheds, like you were saying before, Matt. It, it's a very it's a huge shedding problem where like one person can infect a lot of people in a in a very quick time. I believe time I believe they're called super sh- super shredders. I believe. Yeah, shedders. Or or super whatever. shedders or something like that, where they're 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 particularly um, like they can spread it easily. Like they they you know, excrete the virus more, however, that, like, not, that's very medical, but they excrete the virus more easily so they can infect a lot more people yeah. than, like, your standard, like, patient, which I, yeah. I'm not sure if that, those exist in coronavirus, in, in, uh, in COVID-19. I think they, I think I read about them in the early days when it was, like, specifically just in China, but they definitely did exist in SARS, which is a type of coronavirus, obviously. Yeah. And because of that, it's worse for the elderly population because they're, like, if it's easy to pass then all these there's a higher risk of the elderly getting it and the elderly will get if they get sick even with the flu or whatever they have a higher chance of it developing complications um so that's the issue like that's that's what you have to kind of try to get through to people but unfortunately i don't think there's a there's a 100 percent way where you can like you know sit someone down and be like listen look at this look at this look at this and we'll get through it people are just not designed that way for the most part, like a lot of people lately don't listen to statistics, don't listen to science, don't listen to logic. Um, so I don't I don't like there, there isn't a good answer for this because it's it's almost impossible to convince. Like as soon as someone says, oh, I don't believe in science. That's it. Like that's that's like, the yeah, end sh- of like, the conversation. That's, it, yeah, it it like, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. If you don't believe in science and you don't believe in statistics and you don't believe in what people are, like, like moving know, on, everyone is telling you then that's it like the, there's no point of us communicating any further there's no way i can convince you there's just there isn't so unfortunately that's the that's the case for some people but if you're if you're lucky and someone will listen to you then it's worth it to, to tell them it's not just the flu uh it does have different aspects to it and this is worthwhile like the quarantine is worthwhile and there's a reason why we're doing it and if you know it has never happened before. Like a government wouldn't just call a state of emergency for no reason because it's a huge, huge drain on the economy. It's a huge drain on everyone. Like panic. People are, I would say people are going through it pretty, pretty well compared to what could be like you, like you were saying, like an, an apocalypse type scenario where like it gets out of hand. And people, people are just start, looting and yeah, people are looting and stuff. Like I haven't heard of any looting going on, which is nice. Although what 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 one of the most concerning things is you go into the grocery store and and it's weird and concerning so like the toilet paper is gone which is really weird um some of the medicine is gone but like the shelves look ransacked but like not quite which is the strangest part it's like you go in there and for the most part other than toilet paper and maybe other maybe a few other smaller things other than toilet paper it's just like you're able to get everything like i went in to get a bunch of frozen dinners and it was like that shelf had been ransacked and they were they were tossed all over the place but there were still some left and it, it was weird it's like granola bars they were tossed all over the place but there were still some left it's like what the hell is going on in here like why the hell is people just like it's just like as if they're ransacking but usually when you see ransacked shelves there's very little of everything and like so i would say the stock is down the stock is down of the shelves, talking grocery stores, like I'd say by 50%, but they were also restocking some of the shelves. It was weird. It's like, what are people like, I want to know during those like primetime hours, because I went in at 2 a.m. to avoid crowds intentionally do like, were people panicking to the point where they were literally like putting their arm on the shelf and just shoving shit into their buggy? Like some people, yes. But I, I, the other thing is that we have such strong supply. Let's, and China's like, coming back online too. Which China's coming us. back online. There's no, there's no indication that this is going to affect supply to the point where we're going to be starving or anything like that. Like we're gonna, we're gonna have enough food in our grocery stores. And our like, border think, lockdown doesn't include supply runs either. Like, correct, it, like they're allowing all. those in. Yeah. So supply chains are still intact completely, and there's no indication that this is going to affect the supply chains to a level where we're going to be fighting for food. So at least in Canada, like we're talking Canada here. Canada, God, U.S. God like, knows, God knows what yeah. the hell is happening elsewhere. Canada, U.S. and larger, basically larger countries that are more developed. But um, even 
I, I think it'll be fine for everyone. Like, it, this is not a crippling thing. Like, it's not something that will cripple our entire world infrastructure. It just sounds um, like it, it will. It just sounds yes. like it will. It just sounds like it will because of how people, like, the you know, the state of emergency and all that, but it won't. So that's why we shouldn't be going and hoarding a supplies. We should be buying what we need. And like you said, maybe do a weekly or a bi-weekly run of groceries and don't get, you know, enough to store for a year, get enough for those couple weeks or a month or maybe a little bit less, like just get enough for what you need because people that do need it, that are afraid to go to the stores at like that go to the stores at 2 a.m. need to go there and actually get the supplies they need, like toilet paper. There was also a lineup at 2 a.m., which wasn't great. Yeah. Had to wipe down the buggy with a Lysol wipe. Yep, I did that. Like, I mean, again, these are things like I, 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 I hesitate to say them because it sounds like I'm whining. It's just a matter of it's it's like a different mentality out there now. Yep. Like a guy and sneezed it and I like instinctually, like without even thinking, I just instinctually step back. Yep. Like uh, my whole mentality is different. And for a week, and don't do this, or pro- you probably shouldn't do this, but for a week, like I was constantly like touching my face as like a person does. And for yep. a week, every time I touch my face, I like really slap my hand hard. And end up hurting my thumb, <laughs> actually, for a couple of days. But it taught me, don't fucking touch your face. And then I did, and then I stopped touching my face. Like That's I just cool. wash my hands, so I'm fine. Like, but I even I I do. Yesterday I came down here. I came down here into the into the office, and uh, there was a water bottle, and I couldn't remember whose water bottle that was, and so I had to get a Kleenex, and remove the water bottle into the recycling bin because I couldn't remember whose it was. Okay. Yeah, see, it's weird. It the weird thing is that it happens so quickly to us, and the changes are so quick, and we're we are, but we are adapting. That's like I'm, I'm scared of the adaptation, though. I'm that's scared what of I mean. coming out of it. Like, am I going to be scared now of all door handles? My hands but are it, ruined too. Like they're dry. Maybe as hell. maybe it's a good thing to be scared of door handles. Like maybe this will also impact the future flu viruses. You know what I mean? Like any any flu, like regular flu, which is also like many different strains. But regardless, like if if we are treating this seriously, maybe we'll just continue to treat everything else seriously. Like it's good to wipe down your shopping cart before you take it. Like that's a smart move. Yeah. You know what I mean? We never did that before for the most part. We do like a bag quarantine now too. So if you bring something to the house, we quarantine it for a minimum six hours. Now I don't know how effective that is because it can last longer on there, but it's just like it's almost like a mental thing where we're like, okay, these, this was recently purchased. Move these bags into quarantine. You gotta wait a bit until you use those supplies, and then we start using it. It's it's pretty nuts. Like, I think the mentality is something that's the the hardest part of this is like just mentally dealing with this situation. Because I have ups and downs. Like uh, sometimes I'll be in modes where I'm like really worried. Oh yeah. And it'll it'll affect my day to day and stuff like that. And then sometimes I'll be in in a state of just you know acceptance and I'll just do my normal day to day things and not even think about it. I have so I have like and legitimately for about a week I've had a headache because of this. And I know I know it's because of this because I'll have those moods where sometimes I'll be like super chill and the headache will just go away. And then if I'm any more but super chill, I have a headache. It's just like, a, and, and I and I know what a tension headache feels like for me. It's definitely a tension headache. Like, it feels like I'm about to go into an exam or something that I, that I haven't studied for at all times. It's, it's horrible. One thing I noticed that did help me is cutting down on caffeine. Because um, the more caffeine you drink, the more, like, likely your stress levels will spike if you're already stressed. Um, I'm starting to do a decaf, actually. Yeah, so like I'm trying. That's that's helped me because I, when I was drinking like three cups a day, I I noticed myself being more panicky, and now I'm down to like one or two. So I, I'm I'm a little bit better. But again, it comes in waves and it comes in random things. Like, like I said before, the comments is what kills me. Like whenever I read an article and then I read a comment, the com- that's I, what I, I'm done with the comments for now. Yeah, I can't, yeah don't I can't read the comments. I can't yeah, it. the comments are too. They're, they're too extreme. Like people just go. Either on one extreme that you're an idiot or to the other extreme where this is just like the end of the world or something like that. I don't – don't read the comments. That's my suggestion. Uh, it's, Especially it's on COVID either articles. Either of those things. Like, yeah. If you want some stupid debate about a movie because like people are still doing regular articles. If you That's, want to do some stupid yeah. debate about a movie, go ahead. But like a COVID article where it's like from your government or whatever, just just don't. No. Yeah. Reddit, Reddit COVID news, don't read the comments. Like it's just it, – I'm not going not to Reddit. It. I'm not even going to go to Reddit for that. <laughs> Touch and no, Reddit don't. for that at all. Don't, don't. It's so bad. Um, I just have the Health Canada website up, and I check it every day for the numbers. 
because it gets updated yeah. every day at 9 a.m. Well, so far, anyway. I don't know if it'll be more now, but... Oh, 10.30 a.m. today. Excuse me. They were late. Excuse me. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just... Let's hope for the best. Let's hope that this doesn't last too, too long. Let's hope that everyone kind of comes out of it okay. Uh, that's all that we can really do. But uh, hopefully this isn't, you know, terrible for people to hear. I just want... I, I think I think it's valuable for us to talk about it because not... Some people are tr- are going through this alone. That's another thing that I wanted to to touch oh, on. That, that's like, very true. If you live yeah, alone, the, damn. The the self isolation of this must be really difficult. And like we're lucky that we have our families with us to a certain degree. Um, and I get like you know like I can bounce stuff stuff off of and all that. But there's a lot of people that are just literally like okay, then like I live alone and now I can't go outside and have to deal with this alone. And they're thinking their own thoughts and they don't have someone to hear. They don't have a conversation to hear on the side to bounce their ideas off of. So I'm hoping that this kind of conversation will hopefully uh, let people calm down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. More than anything, because people are thinking the same as you uh, and maybe some differences, but there is all these conversations are happening and just, kind of just keep fighting on and doing what we're being told to do. Like, don't, don't go against the grain too much at this point, in my opinion. Like, don't be, don't be a rebel right now. Um, You can be a rebel, you know, in different situations. That's not a problem. But when it's, when it comes to health, it's just not recommended. It's not recommended because you can affect other people. If you want to put yourself at risk, that's fine. But if you were to infect somebody else and that person were to die, that's like, that's really bad. Really bad. But like, I mean... Somebody, somebody listening to this might get this. It's fucking scary. Some people might already have it. Yeah, it's well, some scary. people might have it. I Real think scary. scary, scary or not scary, it's like it, it, it. For most people, it won't be scary. So I'm just hoping that uh, it won't be. Oh, when they get it, like they'll have mild symptoms I mean. and then yeah, they'll be yeah, like, exactly. "You have it, but you're fine." And be like, "Oh, yeah." So they'll just right. self isolate for a few weeks and that's it. So that's what I'm hoping. Like people will get it. Um, there's no doubt about that. I just don't think. It's still not worth panicking over that. Um, on that note, though, I think let's move on to the working working from home segment. The working right. from home segment. Yeah. So <clears throat> I wrote an article this week. Oh, that's it. I, I cough slightly. Shut it down. <laughs> Went to clear my throat. Shut it down. He's drinking water. Why is he drinking water? He has a sore throat. Shut it down. Um. Anyway, so working from home. Um. I wrote an article about this on Dev as well as uh, like Dev I don't really know what to call it. Just Dev. I wrote it on dev. Like, anyway, dev.to. Is dev.to. What I always say, but that might be. Uh, but anyway, anyway, so I wrote it. I wrote it on dev.to as well as uh, Medium, and uh, I shared it in the Discord. The Medium is a a member link or whatever. So you, but I ha- I put the friend code in the Discord, so you don't you, uh, you if you don't pay for Medium, you can you can read it for free. So you know, go and enjoy that. But yeah, I just wrote wrote an article about working from home and I kind of pulled the three main questions that I hear because there's a bunch of people that are new to working from home uh whether it be due to due to their their office not liking people working from home or if they're you know they're just not exactly like they just don't like it like they like the social aspect of the office and they just always went in so I I kind of just took the three main questions and I thought Mike and I could discuss them uh, three main questions from that article. So the the first one here is, how will you be productive without your team members next to you? Uh, now, of course, I write a whole thing about about this in the in the actual written piece, and what I cover is the lack of someone being next to you in this day and age is very inconsequential. I guess is the word, and the reason why it's inconsequential is because it's so easy to just re- reach out on a chatting app. Now, I know that a lot of workplaces, especially if it's retail, uh, will use chatting apps, but they'll use it for out of office or out of like normal hours communication. So they want to reach you and you're not on shift. That's generally how they'll try to reach you. But these chatting apps are just as versatile to use, you know, during the actual day. And if you're in the office, which is sort of what this article is, is focused on not so much retail, but if you, if you, uh, if you're in the office, you can use these chatting apps just as effectively. I can just so effect, just as effectively message Mike for something. So my one example scenario was that, you know, you're a, de- you're a web dev and you receive a project from your designer and the, you know, it's an Adobe XD and they say, Hey, just make this site. And then you realize like, Hey, wait, I'm not sure how this sliders transition effects are supposed to work. 
So I lay out a couple of different scenarios. So the ideal office scenario when you're actually in the office would be that you would walk over to the designer's desk, ask him the question, and then he would say, you know, this is this is what the transition is supposed to be. Then you go back to your desk and you continue developing. But a typical office situation is that you're going to go over to his desk. He's not going to be there. His colleague's going to be there. You're going to ask them. They're going to like, well, he left a little while ago. He'll probably be back soon. You're probably going to end up chatting with that guy for a while. Only to then realize, hey, this guy isn't back. So 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, whatever. Hey, this guy that I went to talk to isn't back because you lost track of time chatting. So then you go back to your desk and then just send them a message, whether it be an email or whatever. And so you just wasted a whole bunch of time. You wasted time walking over, which is a very small amount, but you wasted time walking over. You wasted time talking to someone else, which also wasted their time. And then you didn't get anything done and you ended up just messaging them anyway. So in this day and age, realistically speaking, with very few exceptions, there's not that big of a benefit to having someone there. If you're like an architect or something and you're physically building models of stuff, then sure, of course, you should probably have, you know, it's beneficial for you to have your colleague there. But for many jobs, it's really not that big of a deal. An email or like a a text message or a phone call can easily solve most issues. Um, I'll jump on to the second question, unless Mike wants to add anything into there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So for, for this, and I... I have a lot of experience with this, uh, not the office portion so much, but I do have some experience in the office, but being remote and what I find works best is to have set meeting times, have short stand up meetings, maybe on a daily basis with your core team members, make them short, make them concise. Like don't, what I like to do is w- go over the topics very briefly and then if you need to expand on them, do that one-on-one with the people that you need to expand on them with. So in a stand-up, you just want to give updates, make sure that everyone's on the same page. The other thing I like to do is to keep open channels of communication. Now, I saw something on Twitter where like, since people are going over to uh, remote from working in an office, people are going to the extreme and being like, respond to any message you get immediately. Uh, check your emails on a minute, like minute to minute basis. Keep all your channels of communication open at all times to make sure that any any manager can contact you. Tell your manager when you're going on a coffee break, tell your man, like it was way too extreme. Like you shouldn't be doing that. That's going to make you way less productive. As a manager, you should never demand that kind of uh, communication. But on the other hand, there should be some level of openness where if someone contacts you during the work, during work hours and you're available to answer, you can answer them, right? Um, sometimes you'll, you won't be available because you'll be out and, you know, washing your hands or going to the bathroom or <laughs> eating. washing your hands. Yeah, but <laughs> that's, 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 that's the society we live in right now. But when we're in that case, you know, someone can be a little bit patient or they can move on to a different task and you can schedule a meetup later on, stuff like that. It shouldn't be de- demanded that you have to answer immediately and it shouldn't be demanded that you have to tell your superior that you're going to, to the washroom. That's, you know, you're being like treated like a child. You should not be treated like a child. I think, so- I think that like asking somebody to do something simple, like use the status, please use the status thing. That's not, that could that's be good too, too. Like that's not too bad. Like you, all yeah. most chat apps have a status thing. Just say, hey, if you're going away for a while, could you mind just putting that little thing on there so people know you'll be back or whatever? Exactly. But another thing that I want to mention is that uh, it could be beneficial. Like, well, like what Matt was saying, in an office setting, what you have to do to be able to communicate with someone is get up out, out, off your desk, bring whatever you need with you. Like if you have a laptop, bring a laptop. If you have papers that you want to show them, bring them to their desk, sit back down at their desk, show them, sh- show them. In this scenario, you don't have to do that. You just have to go into a chat app, share with them what you need to share with them. And you can talk about it through either texting, through, through the messaging platform, if it's not something very important and you can get convey the message quickly through texting or get on a quick call with video, screen sharing, whatever, and get hash it out like that. It could actually be more effective. And in my opinion, most of the time is more effective to go through a chatting app than it is to go like person to person because you have the opportunity of screen sharing. You have the opportunity of not getting out of your desk, breaking your concentration, uh, and you have all the tools in front of you at your disposal pretty much. So use them to, to your great advantage. And with that, what I want to promote, and this is my biggest, I think my my biggest takeaway from this episode is do your best to not only do just as much work as you were doing before, try to really make this work at home stick for your company. 
because what what's happening right now in uh, in China apparently, and this is something that I've heard on a side note. Like I, ha- I don't have an article to share with you, but what I heard is that a lot of a lot of companies are coming back to the office, but some of them are realizing that their productivity in the office is actually lower than their productivity at home, so they're going back home. So think about that if you're one of those people that really like working from home and you think you can manage it. Try to, you know, optimize your time at home and try to make it seem like not seem, but it will be a better atmosphere for you and your and your team. Maybe have like a couple days of work at home policy, whatever. Like maybe that's gonna happen in the future. That's what I think this this is the positive of this, <laughs> is it's a huge experiment, a huge work from home experiment for so many companies that something has to come, like a big change will come in in terms of offices. I I agree with that. Um, I, I definitely think that you should be trying to make a like a really good impression on, like don't don't be like a you know don't be messing around and 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 taking the whole day off to watch TV instead of doing stuff, stuff like that. Like don't be like, if you like it, make it look like it's really good because if you're able to make it look like it's really good, then it's really good. You know, productivity, the numbers, whatever, don't lie. And if you have a manager or a team or a company that you work for that is extremely into numbers and extremely into tracking, then um, that's like, well, I actually just recently I saw uh, a program. I had no idea these existed because I just didn't even think of looking at them. I saw a guy was looking at installing a program that tracked every window of everything that an employee was doing. And you could flag certain things like you could flag like YouTube, Facebook, whatever, and they would be in the red category. This would be in the yellow. This would be in the green for productivity. And then they would be like, oh, you went to YouTube at this time. Why did you go to YouTube? And then you would have to like explain yourself. So you could like easily print a report and be like, okay, you were here for eight hours and YouTube was open for half an hour. Why was that? Like you were you were being unproductive on company time. Like what were you doing? And to me, that is so like handholdy. Like, it's so weird being, because like, I'm, like I've like i recently mentioned on other episodes that I've started to delegate, like, tasks out to, to, like, contractors and such. And one of the things is, is certainly, you know, there'll be, I don't want to call it corrective action because that sounds almost like discipline, but, like, corrective action is in, like, hey, like, you know, we'll use this for password management. Hey, we'll use this for, like, note management. Hey, we'll use this for this. So there's some policies that, like, we have when I'm delegating stuff out, but in the most part, I kind of let the... The people do what they want, and if the result is is coming out fine, I'm not going to question them. You know, they always give me something at four in the morning. I don't care as long as it's on time and stuff. Like that's, you know, that's totally fine to me. I'm not going to be like, well, were you sitting at your desk at, during that time, or were you watching TV and had a laptop on your lap? Because you're not allowed to have that TV on. Like I'm not going to be like that's ridiculous. Because now yeah. I'm micromanaging to the point where their productivity, they're going to be pissed off, and then their productivity is going to be really like down, regardless, regardless of where they are. Because they're gonna be think that they, like they're being watched. Like th- that that software to me was like super invasive. Like I I don't agree with that at all. Maybe for and detrimental. Schools. It's detrimental, like to to the productivity. Because if you're constantly worried about going on a site or whatever, like you could be on YouTube, you could be watching a tutorial, but you would be hesitant to do that if you had some sort of traffic tracking software because you'd have to explain yourself. You have to explain and yourself. Maybe prove it. Yeah. Right. Like so, I wouldn't do it. Like if if that was the case, I would be like, okay, well then I'm just gonna have to figure this out myself. I'm not going to watch tutorial. And this and this software too like tracked whether the window was active too. So if you yeah. had like a tab open with YouTube and you like watch it over lunch and then you forgot about it, you could actually get like it would it would still track it and say like oh it wasn't the active window but it was open all afternoon. So then that's like a big flag like whoa, this thing has been open for 3 to 6 hours. Like what the heck's going on here? I think I think something uh, to note is I'm with you 100% Matt on the letting your employees do their best work the way that they want to do it. Like if, if your employee is on the couch, just doing like, if he gets it done on his phone somehow, I don't care. Like I literally I don't, don't care. care. Yeah. I don't care how he does it. As long as it's done to a, to a certain degree of professionalism and a certain degree of timeliness, I don't care how it's done, how long it takes, uh, you know, within the the bounds of the time frame. But on the other hand, there are some people that can't do work in that kind of like relaxed environment. Right. And might take advantage in which case, in my opinion, it's fine that some places have a more strict policy that exists It's because it's better for people that need that strict environment because everyone's different and that's okay. But for me personally, I wouldn't like if I see that it's not working out, 
then it's not working out. Like I'm, it's not, there's no hard feelings and be like, you know, I don't hate, I wouldn't hate the person. I'd be like, okay, this, this isn't the right kind of work environment for you. I'm not going to try to, you know, put, implement the methods to try to make him a better, uh, programmer through a different way than I usually do it. I'd rather just hire someone else that's more aligned to the type of management style that I'm going to be giving. Yeah, like if you had you know a really I mean? great programmer and you you decided to use a certain CMS and then they decided to take their own thing and make their like do use a different CMS, that's sort of I mean I, I again I hesitate to use the word insubordinate, but that's not great. You know, no. they're not following the company policy where you're like, Well, I told the customer we were gonna be using WordPress and you went out and you used Couch CMS, like this is not good and now all that time's wasted. Right. So stuff like that. Absolutely. Or the or the environment, you know, whatever. Like if, if the employee is incapable at the end of the day of actually providing you with something that they are supposed to be able to provide you within the time limit that they set. And there's and we're reasonable, like things come up. Of course, it's tech. Of course, things come up. Then if they're unable to do that, then they're just not suitable for the job. Like that's just that's just that easy. And again, yeah. you're, you, you're reasonable. People make mistakes and stuff. But. That is the reality. If if you put me into a, the, the shoes of a car mechanic, I will tell you right now that I will underperform to every degree because I have trouble taking like a bolt off. So like a singular bolt. So let's, uh, you know, let's not put me in those shoes. <laughs> like, yep. um, but that actually leads really well into the second point or the second question, which is uh, how are you going to avoid all these distractions? So I'm, I might be a little weird in this one. Uh, and I mentioned this in a previous episode, but like, uh, I might be a little strange because I actually say don't. One of the things that I do is sometimes I'll just wake up and, you know, it's supposed to be doing something and it'll be crazy, right? It'll be like people will be calling me. It'll be nuts. And like, I was supposed to do X task that was planned, but that gets pushed aside and I got to do these other things. And now that thing's like, like it's crazy. And I, you know, I jump to the occasion and I will do all my stuff right away. But then sometimes it's like a slower morning. So then I'll just chill in the morning, you know, check my emails, do that stuff. Sometimes I'll do a little work on my phone and maybe I'll like watch an episode of something and then I'll start work. Sometimes if I'm like in the middle of the day and I'm going to get like super anxious doing something, I'll be like, okay, like I know I'm going to be just freaking out and I'm distracted. Let me just watch like a quick episode of something or let me throw on a podcast and just chill for a couple minutes and then I'll get slowly get back to the work. What I'm basically getting at is I give in to the distractions because I think that it's unrealistic for humans to not be distracted. Your home is designed generally so that you you are distracted. It's an, it's it, Your home is a distraction from what you were doing all day, from the work you were doing all day. And as a result, there's going to be these distractions all around you. And even when you're in the office, you're going to be distracted by the thought of doing your hobbies and those other distractions. And so to me, it's like, would I rather have an employee that's normally supposed to have a 20-minute break like for lunch, take a 40 minute break, watch a whole whole episode of something they wanted to watch, come back refreshed. Or do I want them to watch 20 minutes and then be like really thinking like, man, I really want to watch that episode. And that distracts them from their work after they're probably losing more than 20 minutes in there anyway. Again, I don't really care about the we about hours either. Like if, if there's been days where I'm like, fuck man, like I really don't want to do anything today. Like I, I have a headache or like I just done. I'll sometimes not start work until 5 p.m., but then I'll work until, like, 1 in the morning because I'll get into something and I'll just, like, really, 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 like, quickly bang it out kind of thing. That's just the that's just the type of person I am. Like, I was editing the podcast last week at 5 in the morning. That's why it was, like, well, it was slightly late, too, because I couldn't I couldn't upload or something. I can't remember what the heck the problem was, but, um, oh, no, my, uh, all my computers, uh, all my updates. computers were filling up their, all of their primary drives. That was really good. All my computers. That was really great. Uh, but... They're really good on an SSD's lifespan. Anyway, but yeah, like it, it's just it's just one of those things where I I'm absolutely willing to I, actually I'll, I'll say this the the measures that people take to like companies and managers take to cancel out distractions or force you to not be distracted and force you to work or try to force you to work is maybe mandatory for employees that don't take any pride or don't care about what they're doing. Now, even if I don't take pride in the work I'm doing, or like, because I used to work in a factory, it's like, I'm not going to take pride in every muffin that gets pumped out of that place. But I did still want to do a good job. So like, I had to care for the job enough to be like, I'm going to make sure these muffins don't have like metal in them or whatever I was doing, whatever job I was in. And so those employees, the ones that care and will beat themselves up if they make a, make a mistake are only going to be f- further punished by you when they've already punished themselves sort of thing. Whereas the employees that don't care and are just there for the paycheck 
are maybe the ones that need to be monitored. And to be honest, maybe those are the ones that need to be cut. It depends what you say when they're just there because most employees are just there for the paycheck. Like you're not – most employees aren't willingly going to the work to to work to just – make the company better you know what i mean no but like, they like i mean to the point i guess i should clarify so what i mean by just there for the paycheck is in i mean like straight up you're there for the paycheck and you're not you're not doing a good job like you're showing up you're you're, you're late you're never at your desk you're always chatting at the water cooler you're never completing anything on time you're avoiding meetings you're avoiding calls you're avoiding the manager. You're t- you're taking advantage of all your work from home day policy, and you're not doing anything on those work from home days. Those type of people, where they don't care, and they don't care that they are not doing well. Like to me, I I to me, sometimes on those days where I I just I'm like I'm I can't I just can't even today <clears throat> to make it to make it trendy, <laughs> and I'm like I'm just gonna watch a show. Like I'm just whatever. I just needed like a little bit of a break. As, assuming there's nothing you know emergency going on, and I just have a general workload. I will take a break for that afternoon, and then at 5 p.m. I might be like, "Hey, I like, I'm starting to feel guilty for not doing any work." Just like a natural feeling of like, "Man, I really should get to work," and so then I just like start doing it. Those employees, those people that actually want to do a good job and that type of thing, I think are the ones you want to hang on to. Whereas the ones that don't like have no sense of self punishment, if you will, where they don't care, they're like, "Well, I screwed over like a bunch of like this productive thing." (laughs) Haha. Like they don't care, then it's then we're at the point where, okay, then if you don't care, then get out. Yeah, I think one one big issue that people will have with this whole work from home thing is there's going to be a lot of people that are going to have to pick up the slack for the people that can't do it. You know what I mean? There has to be a way to promote responsibility within a group team atmosphere. Um, I think developers in general are good at that. I think developers are good at working in groups and being able to perform and do the responsibilities. I think other areas will suffer more. Not to say that all developers teams are amazing, but I'm just saying like in general, we're better at doing this whole work from home thing anyway. Like our our job is more inclined to a work from home kind of atmosphere. Uh, Whereas other jobs like maybe banking or something like that is, is a little bit harder to do and a little bit harder to motivate yourself to go in and like check all your Excel sheets and stock portfolios for your clients and all that. Like I, maybe I'm just not interested in, I don't know, but regardless, I think accountability has to be put into place where if you're on a team and you have someone that's really like slacking his work from home duties, you have to be able to, you know, go to him and be, or, or, or her and be like, listen, there's, we have to get this going because if we don't, then when we come back to work, there's going to be consequences. So like they're going to stop all work from home policies. They're going to like, you know, institute a very strict policy on you know using YouTube and all that. Like we're going to have very detrimental effects because of what you're doing. So you have to put it kind of on yourself or speak like I don't know. I don't know if I promote the whole going straight to the manager aspect of this um, because I like to kind of be direct to the people that are affecting me as much as I can. And then if that doesn't work, then I go, like I would go to the manager. Um, but regardless, you have to get it solved somehow, because if there's one person that's bringing the whole team down, they have to be dealt with in one way or another. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Uh, I would say, I would say that I would say that you need to, it, it's, it's sort of that group mentality where you absolutely need to be accountable, but you also need to look at the accountability of your team as well. And you have to sort of say, Hey, you know, if we all, if, if there's five of us and four to five of us really like this work from home thing, but the one guy is either slacking or he's just having trouble with it, you know, you can either have, try to help them through it or whatever. Um, I agree with the direct approach uh, in most cases, unless the person is very standoffish in general, then you kind of have to get management involved. I, I would agree with that because sometimes people are just like, no, like you're my colleague. I'm not listening to you. And then it's like, okay, yeah. well, fair enough. Then I'll have to go, go, go higher up then. Um, but like, I agree with you there though, is that like, you don't want the one person dragging the whole team down. And also you don't want the whole person dragging the whole team down where if your office does not have a work from home policy and will not have a work from home policy after this is over, you do not want to be stuck working ridiculous overtime because someone who was slacking during the mandatory work from home era, that's, that's no good hundred percent. So I agree with that. Um, 
And that actually, again, actually transitions nicely to the next question, which is, will you be able to get all your work done? So this really kind of depends on you. Uh, ultimately, you have to really sort of just you have to just know what what environment you like best. And I've kind of subcategorized into, you know, different categories here. So some people really need that office environment. Some people like a quiet environment, etc. So the subcategories I have here are a quiet environment, a noisy environment, and then I have like a, a couple of catch-alls. So if all else fails, basically. So the first one is if you need a quiet room, you know, finding literally a quiet room. So like a room that maybe not necessarily is a home office, but a room that is like completely in solidarity, whether that be like a like a den or like maybe even your bedroom, if you can bring a laptop in there or something, just something that's quiet and you're like alone, that might just do it for you. Don't be conformed to that desk. If that desk is near the near the kitchen and the kitchen's really loud, just maybe move. Um, also, if your home is noisy, then just grabbing straight up some earplugs to block the noise uh, or even noise canceling headphones with nothing on. Turn on that active noise canceling and then that will, you know, you'll slowly, you'll slowly or at least you should slowly get into the groove of doing whatever work you're doing. Now, if you need a noisy environment, this is often easy for people that don't live alone. So you can, you know, do something like, well, even if you do live alone, you can do something like play a podcast or a TV show. Uh, I always recommend a TV show that you've seen a few times or seen recently so that you just mostly listen to the audio and you don't pay attention to the video. Um, also having maybe like a fan or another white noise machine playing so that you just have like that white noise. Uh, also, uh, there's a variety of uh, focus playlists that can be found on Spotify and other uh, music streaming services. And I'm sure on YouTube as well, those type of things will, uh, will help you or may help you. Um, also moving from a quiet study. So let's say you do have a home office and it is really quiet there. You could move actually from that home office, um, into one of the more lived areas of the house, like the kitchen, uh, or the living room. We bring that laptop in there, and if you need the noises and stuff like that, maybe uh, maybe your partner's watching TV. You could just sit there and like type away while the TV's on, or like they're making dinner, or like whatever is going on in the house. That kind of helps you with the noisy environment. So there's kind of solutions there for both uh, both people that live alone and live live in a group. But also, I would say it's probably easiest if you're if you live with other people because they're just going to be making noise regardless, and that's just sort of more natural noise at that point. Um, now, if all else fails, a couple of points here. So if all else fails, uh, you could, and I really do not recommend this at this day and age, but you could go to a co-working space. Now, there's nothing wrong with a co-working space from a business perspective. You know, you can rent it for, you know, an hour, a day, a month, whatever it is. You can rent a desk. You can rent an office. You can rent. They all have different options. It's basically just a whole bunch of businesses that are in one office. So think of it just as one office. There's a cubicle section. There's an office section. There's a kitchenette and maybe a break room, whatever. They're all different slightly. And basically, you can rent a little portion of that. And there's all these different businesses all over the place. You know, all different things. They're all working in this co-working space, which is great you know, there's nothing wrong with that, except for when you're supposed to be socially distancing. So you probably shouldn't be doing that right now. It's a catch all, but I really don't recommend it. I would say like, just, just stick it out. And that leads to the next point, which is actually just force yourself to adapt. Now this is horrible. This sucks. Cause you're like, I hate this. But at the end of the day, if you had to work from home at all times, because the office like was gone, if the office just went boop and just like went out of space, you're not just going to like all of a sudden quit your job and everything like that. Like you're going to you're going to have to force to adapt in a home office. Now, one of the things I would say is, though, is do not focus on your productivity. Don't focus on, you know, how much it sucks and don't focus on those those things. Just literally focus on the work and slowly but surely you'll find small adaptations for yourself. On Like well, maybe you like to work in a noisy environment for a bit and then you like to move to a quiet or whatever your unique flavor is. You'll find little t- tips and tricks of your own for your own work environment where you're like, oh, well, while I'm writing emails, I need quiet. But while I'm doing data entry, I would like some noise. And you, you'll you learn those little things like I did where I just said, I'm willing to work until one in the morning if I just don't feel like working during the afternoon kind of thing. And and that those are little tips and tricks that are unique to every person. And you'll eventually learn that. And you will slowly but surely your productivity will climb. You know, if you focus on the fact, it, it's just like being sick. If you're if you're sick or if you're like having like a panic attack and you're you're panicking about whatever it is, and then you're panicking about the fact that you're having a panic attack and you want it to go away, it's never going to go away. Like it's going to take a long freaking time. You have to be distracted and let the let yourself recover. And this is the same, in my opinion, this is the same way to to handle this. If you hate working from home, don't focus on the fact that you hate it. Focus on the fact that you're like, I have to get this done. Like, that's what you should be thinking. I have to get this done. You go in the, uh, go in the living room. That's too noisy. I have to get this done. You go into the other room. Oh, I, you know, it's a little better here, but like, I just, I need this done. 
and it's not, you know, I'm just not working as fast as I can. And you go to the other place, but don't worry about like, don't look at your productivity sheet or anything, just work through it. And then I think you'll eventually just figure it out. And a couple days later, you'll be near as productive as you would be in an office. Yeah, those are all really good points. Um, I think the only wrench in all of this is uh, people with kids, like younger kids. Um, I think one point that I want to make is like neither Matt and I are have kids, but if I was in a management position and I had a whole team that I had to manage and some people had to, you know, have like three, three or four kids at home while they're working from home, I'd probably be a little bit lenient because I don't know how I would expect work to get done no matter what, but to a certain degree, like what are you going to do? Like they can't go to school. You can't go put them in daycare. You can't like there, you have to have some leniency in this situation because this isn't a normal, normal work from home situation. Um, so just keep that in mind, at least if you're in a management position or you will be in a management position in this kind of situation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just make sure that, you know, you have some sort of <laughs> have a heart essentially, because I can't, I can't even imagine having to deal with like small kids especially in like a one or two bedroom apartment and then trying to work from home at the same time. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I do. I don't know. I don't know what tips I would have for you. I don't think there are any tips for that situation. Like just try to get as much work done in the slow lulls as po- humanly possible. I guess you'll get better at uh, productivity. Probably when this all is said and done, you'll probably be more productive in the end because you'll be able to utilize very small f- time frames to get a lot of work done. I bet that that would be the that would be the case of those people. So maybe in the future I'd be looking to hire people that survive this uh, <laughs> the the epidemic with kids at home because they'd probably be able to like do they, stuff like in their very productivity short survived time. throughout the pandemic and having kids working from home. Exactly, exactly. Super that's versatile. Gonna, that's gonna breed yeah, breed a whole new employee. This is gonna be interesting. The uh, there's there's a lot of talk about the the fallout and the changes and everything that this is going to bring about once it all ends. And if it's a brief one, like China's coming back already, like I'm surprised that they're coming back so quickly. I actually wonder whether there's not going to be many changes or whether there's going to be the smart entrepreneurs that pick up the people like you're saying, where you pick up the good employees that you, however you found out, you know, with, via the interview process where you found out that this is how they handled such a crazy situation. And you're like, okay, you know, that's pretty good. Like, you know, you were versatile enough to do X thing with kids or whatever it was. So, you know, you're a good employee, period. Mm-hmm. That's it. Ne- Just another, n- another like, interview thing that you could be do- dealing with. Like, there would be a good interview question. Like, how, if you have kids at home, like, how how do you deal with this kind of situation? Because maybe it'll happen again. 100%. It, it's... Uh... I, I, you got to get your the, positives out of this as much as you can. That's the thing. Like you got to, as a, as a society, we have to be able to, you know, adapt, evolve, all that stuff. So there, there is going to be some business opportunities after all this is said and done. Like I can't imagine the boom that's going to happen with all the different industries once you know the quarantines are lifted. Or maybe watch it, like watch we, them not come back, and then watch the panic maybe, strike. Maybe a couple people, couple. There's going to be. Things that don't come back. Like, I don't know what's going to happen uh, with the airlines. I don't want to get too conversational again, but uh, like the airlines are boned. They're in trouble. Pretty badly. They're in trouble. Yeah. Like, yeah. Hotels, big trouble. Travel, all tourism and travel is just museums and stuff. Like, what's, what's going to happen to them? There's, I don't there's know. bailouts and stuff, though, that's coming out. And I'm sure that I, I, I honestly think for a lot of industries, it's going to be like hitting the pause button. Like I, I, because like rent and stuff like like sometimes in in some in some jurisdictions, not in Canada so far, as far as I know, uh, rent and stuff is still is like actually paused, but I I would assume also that property taxes are and stuff are paused, so it's literally like you're pausing time and then rebooting, it's literally like that, uh, for some jurisdictions, and I think that maybe the government is watching that and being like, whoa, people are getting in trouble and getting evicted, we need to stop this right now. Which makes sense, but like again, the government doesn't have infinite money. There's not going to be no consequences, is what I'm saying. Like there has to be, not that there should, not, not that I'm saying that like people are deserve it or anything. I'm just saying there has to be, there will be some consequences to this. To oh, this there's going to be some the government aftermath. Can't, Absolutely, can't can't bail everyone out, 
um, because they're just they, they can't make money up on the spot. Like it's just not possible. So they're gonna have to weigh their like who they bail out, what they do, like what how they help. It's gonna be a different world. There's gonna be a little bit of a different world after this. So we'll we'll see. It's interesting. Now we have a web news, uh, but I'm already half hour late. <laughs> Yeah, let's um, let's move it on to the next one, the next weeks. Yeah, so you want you want to push the web news like we? Uh, or you can absolutely do it yourself, but I'll have to drop off. I think because I'm like I said, I'm already a half hour late. Um, what do you want to do? Uh, like we're at we're at like yeah, a little over an hour, so we we sometimes go an hour and a half. We sometimes go an hour. It's yeah. up to you. If let's uh let's let's do it next week. It's you okay. do it next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um. Alrighty. Well, uh, I guess I'll run the old conclusion then. Well, let's do a teaser then. So next week, ooh, NPM purchased by GitHub and Microsoft. And what that means for you. I think next week we're going to try to do a technical episode. I think that's a good idea. Yes. Let's bring it back to some normality and stuff like that. Anyway, and I've been eyeing up Tailwind UI, which is a new thing. And I've been wanting to either talk about Vue or Svelte or both. I want to talk about them. I've been kind of doing a little bit of research into both. Uh, well, I mean, I've been working with Vue for a long time, but Svelte is something that I've been kind of wanting to figure out why, essentially. <laughs> like the big, the big question for me is like, why switch to Svelte right. from React or Vue? So maybe that'll be the the episode. Yeah. So we'll we'll try to do a technical episode. This was just, I mean, this is a non normal episode for non normal times, and uh, we'll be we'll be back to our we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming shortly. Like you know. We should do all like TV intros and outros. It's a little bit too good, at least in my mind. It's a little bit too good. Uh, but uh, thank you for listening, and make sure you don't miss an episode by subscribing on the platform of your choice. You can follow us on the socials. We had at HTML all the things on Facebook and Instagram. You can also follow us on Twitter. That's at at HTML everything. We're on Medium. We're on uh, GitHub. And remember, we're also on Patreon. That's patreoncom slash things. Check out the tiers and give that a go. And many thanks to our three dollar tier patron Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript. Find him at youtubecom RabbitWorks JavaScript. Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. Find him at localpathcomputing.com. Craig, aka Cosworth. Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital. Find him at blueblackdigital.com. Chris from Self Made Web Designer. Find him at selfmadewebdesigner.com. Tim from The Web Hacker. You can find him at thewebhacker.com. And DL Ford from dlford.io. Feel free to leave a comment or review on the platform you're listening to this on. And we are signing off. Yeah.